For those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, Namibian program, it really is one of the most successful conservation initiatives, certainly on the African continent, uh, together with the one in, uh, in the Northern Ranges Trust in Kenya. So well done, John. Um, this program says that uh, conservationists are emerging from unexpected sources, including gangs in Brazil, poachers in Namibia. The story of African parks, I'm afraid, isn't nearly as exciting as either of those. Uh, but it does start with a uh, very passionate young guy at the age of 13 uh, in, in rural Zimbabwe uh, who was uh, extremely keen on the, uh, on the bush and on wildlife. And I think today it's something where that organization now has grown into uh, probably one of the biggest conservation movements on the continent, uh, and there's more to come. So for those of you that aren't familiar with African parks, uh, it's an organization which formerly, after many years, we established in the uh, year 2000 um, to take on protected areas. So what John was talking about were community conservancies. These are specifically the national parks and formerly gazetted protected areas. And what was happening at the time, and which is still happening today, when you've got overall governance challenges, if you want to put it more strongly, governance failure, it's not possible to expect that national parks are going to thrive in a system where you've got governance failure. So the whole thing about African parks was uh, to step in and to be able to take responsibility for some of these areas. If we're successful, uh, then we'll be able to secure as many as 100 uh, protected areas that are bigger than 100,000 hectares. That isn't a lot. Uh, but that is the opportunity that faces us. We as African Parks pioneered the concept of what we call public-private partnerships uh, in protected area management. What we like to say is the PPP concept, though, often stands for patience, politeness, and perseverance, because that's what it takes to do conservation in Africa. And, and what we do as an organization is take on this long-term commitment. So we have agreements with governments, uh, with communities, anywhere between 25 years and 100 years. So we're in for the long haul. Conservation is not a three or five year program, it's a hundred year, a hundred year commitment. So this is where we're working in Africa. Uh, the green dots are the, uh, the areas where we, the protected areas we, uh, where we have mandates for. Um, so we've got 10 national parks under management. The blue ones are areas which we are in the process of bringing under management. Uh, and that covers about uh, 6 million hectares. So that's not six million hectares that we influence, it's six million hectares that we have direct responsibility for. So what happens in these areas is essentially, uh, if it works, then we can uh, pat ourselves on the back. If something goes wrong, it's our fault. These are some of the landscapes, just a couple of pretty pictures that show the diversity uh, of the different types of uh, habitats uh, and regions that we're working in. Um, and of course, with the different habitats come all the different species, ones that uh, uh, you'll be very familiar with in terms of uh, what we call the big and hairies, uh, the megafauna, uh, but that just represents the, the, the bigger picture. Obviously, the smaller stuff is, uh, is equally important as well. The challenge is, is considerable. Um, for those of you that heard Gary Nell speaking uh, earlier today, talking about another billion people in Africa in the next 30 years. Uh, and unfortunately, when you've got a billion people, a billion more people, uh, this photograph was taken a year ago. So even today, we have the most incredible impact on the natural resources of Africa. That's a little national park in Malawi, uh, only 70,000 hectares. If that park wasn't there, in my view, it would take probably two years before the park on the left looked like the area on the right, and hence the importance to make sure that we uh, conserve some of these very, very last areas. Uh, the challenges are many. Uh, complete overfishing of rivers, of lakes uh, for, for protein, uh, wire snaring. Uh, that represents about half the wire snares taken out in less than one year. Uh, two warehouses full of over 30,000 snares. Uh, each one has the potential to entrap an animal for the, uh, for the bush meat market. Again, protein is an important requirement for everyone. Slides that, uh, pictures that you are all familiar with, I won't linger on it too long. Um, this was taken a while ago. Uh, I can tell you now we had another nine elephant that were poached in Garamba National Park ten days ago. Uh, and in the ensuing process lost two of our, uh, two of our ranges as well. So it's something where it's, 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 it's heavy going, it's, uh, it's very, very real work. That's the context, so 
in terms of our, our response to that, it's a very busy slide. I don't expect you to be able to read uh, any of it. But if you want to look after a single protected area, you've got to do all of those things. And if you're not doing all of those things, I hate to say it, it's not quite the three-legged stool, it's the five-legged stool, but one leg that doesn't work, that entire thing is going to fall over. So uh, the key, the pillars of what we do, law enforcement, are extremely important. It's the foundation to a, a properly functioning society. Um, and remember, what's good for, uh, for wildlife is what's good for people. So people need, in order to thrive, a good system where they can have uh, uh, stability, safety, and security. It's not just for the wildlife. In terms of biodiversity conservation, reintroductions, monitoring, uh, all of those aspects, the community development, making sure that people are benefiting from wildlife. If they're not going to benefit from it, as John was saying, they are probably not going to be uh, conservationists. Uh, enhancing the economic impact of these areas, making sure that uh, conservation areas are competitive as a form of land use and contribute to the overall society. And then extremely importantly and often over missed, the infrastructure and the management that's necessary to make these areas work. These areas are failing because of bad governance, uh, bad governance often at a macro level, so you've got to bring in good governance at a, at a micro level in order to show that uh, uh, overall, the overall impact is long-term protected area sustainability. So then just quickly, a, um, uh, just a couple of uh, pictures of what the law enforcement's about. So we have 850 rangers that are fully trained, fully equipped, well armed, extremely well trained. Uh, uh, it's important to emphasize that to enforce the law, they must first uphold the law. So bringing discipline, safety, and security to these very, very large areas, as I say, is as good for people as it is uh, for wildlife. Um, I think this last year we had over 600 convictions, 600 arrests, um, 30,000 snares removed, over 100,000 rounds of ammunition taken out of the system, and all of that is, um, as I say, is, is good for people. Uh, in terms of wildlife management, uh, we do everything that's necessary in the parks from, from collarings. Uh, last year, I think, we had over, over 160 different collarings that then we are able to follow up and to be able to monitor. Uh, in terms of what's happening to those different uh, uh, different uh, species, and I think that was over nine different species where that uh, that was involved. Reintroductions: If we take over a park that has uh, lost species, it's important to be able to bring them back again. Again, last year we moved uh, uh, over 260 elephant to restock a park that had lost all its elephant, and this uh, this photograph is taken from that. Uh, it looks like an elephant whisperer. That elephant is darted and it is about to go down. So it doesn't look like he's, uh, uh, yeah, going to lead it all the way to a different park. Um, uh, over 1,300 head of other species of major game. You're talking buffalo, sable antelope, zebra, giraffe, that are all being reintroduced into a park to to bring it back again and to be able to make it successful. Community development absolutely essential. Uh, if you, again, if you want people to, to support your conservation efforts, the best way to do that is to make sure that they benefit from it as, uh, as well. Um, through enterprise, uh, through, through education initiatives. Uh, last year we built uh, uh, nine different schools. We had over 3,000 children in the schools built by African Parks. We supported over 260 teachers, and all of those people are linked to the conservation efforts, and they appreciate it. Uh, in terms of tourism, again, it's not just setting these areas aside. It's important that we add economic value to them. Uh, and one of the best ways of doing that is through tourism, completely compatible with conservation, as long as it's done carefully. Um, and, and again, that generates uh, more jobs, more enterprise around these uh, uh, conservation areas. And then, of course, the management and infrastructure, um, building of roads, getting supply routes in place. Uh, even down to things like making sure that you've got boards that are properly functioning for each of these areas, that they're having their board meetings, that they're getting unqualified audits, because ultimately the governance of these parks is, uh, is just as important as it might be moving 260 elephant. This summit is about optimism. I'm going to use one quick story, because I know we're running out of time, uh, about a very specific park in, uh, in, in Chad. I'm not sure that many of you would even be able to point out to where Chad is in the, in the map of Africa. A uh, massive country um, with the, in the just, yeah, uh, uh, 
terrible environmental pressures. You've got the Sahara moving uh, southwards. Um, you've got a lot of pressure coming out of North Sudan, out of Darfur, out of uh, South Sudan as well. Uh, and natural resources are something that, you, uh, uh, that, yeah, that people rely on to survive. The situation in Chad, uh, six or seven years ago, there were four and a half thousand, well, it was a bit more, sorry, about ten years ago, there were four and a half thousand elephants in, in Zakuma National Park in Chad. By the time the president of Chad asked us to come and get involved, that was down to 420 left. So losing approximately 800 elephant a year to some uh, pretty militarized people coming out of, uh, out of Darfur. What did we do as African parks to turn that situation around? Uh, uh, to an extent, it is fighting fire with fire. So uh, we made sure that the range of force was extremely well trained, properly equipped um, with the right um, yeah, with the right, right weaponry, the right, uh, the, we put them on horses so that they uh, had an advantage in terms of their patrolling and, uh, uh, and started patrolling the area uh, extremely well. Not without its real challenges, I might add. Uh, in our first year of operation, we had six of our guards executed by the Janjaweed. They were in the morning prayers. Uh, they were mowed down and they were literally then uh, uh, finished off one by one. And this is the price that people pay. Uh, might have mentioned that uh, just this last week we buried two of our rangers in Garamba National Park. It's, it's an incredibly tough place to be on the front line, and these are the stakes, but these are the people that commit their, uh, uh, their lives to this uh, extremely worthy purpose. We put in a, uh, a quite a sophisticated control center, making use of technology, radio systems, collars on the animal, to make sure that all the elephants are basically protected 100% of the time. We engaged, very importantly, with the local communities. This is a, a picture uh, of, a, of a school, typical in, uh, in uh, eastern Chad. Um, so by building the schools, by bringing the children into the, uh, uh, into the schooling, making sure that they're understanding what you're about, we put a, a radio station in every single one of these schools. So the moment that you have people coming out of northern Sudan that are on their way to the park, I promise you these people are not uh, taking out the American Express card and paying for accommodation and meals on the way. These people are raping, they're pillaging and they're plundering and when they get to Zakuma they poach. So it's something where uh, the communities around Zakuma have an incredible incentive to make sure that the moment that they see these people on their way to call in the scouts uh, and to be able to come and respond to that situation. And if you treat, uh, we are there for the conservation, we are there for the elephants but if you make sure that you use those resources for the same reason that you are uh, looking after elephant for protecting people, those very people become the protectors uh, of those elephants. You're completely aligned. Um, as a result of that, uh, there's 420 elephant that I mentioned. Um, for, uh, because of the pressures they were under, they did not have any babies under the age of five years. Um, and it's something where I'm happy to report now that uh, we have now just counted 81, uh, 81 babies over three years old. Um, and that means that that population of 420 has now broken through the 500 level mark. Um, it's something where our next target now will be a thousand level mark. And I think that that is, uh, uh, yeah, so for the first time in over a decade, the elephants are on the rise. You can see the, uh, uh, many of the babies in the, in, in the picture there. Uh, and I think that that is uh, something to celebrate and something to be optimistic about. Thank you very much.